Welcome back to the final in a three-part series on police use of force and firearms trainings and how they shape police interactions in the field. If you haven't watched the first two, please go watch them because I am going to be making a lot of broad statements based on conclusions I've already built off of in those videos. Let me remind you one more time of the former police officers who I asked to help and consult me on this video. Phil, please introduce yourself. You'll see him a few times throughout this video. Hey there, uh, my name is Phil. Uh, I run a little YouTube channel called That Dang Dad, and I was a police officer in a pretty busy area of Southern California for about eight years. But uh, now I'm a police and prison abolitionist because I believe that the current system is not working and it's not making any of us any safer. I think it's pretty clear that these trainings are not actually doing a good job giving police examples of what they will actually see in real life, but let's just set that entirely aside and pretend that that's not an issue and that these are in fact reality. These trainings will 100% create the outcome where innocent people are killed by cops. And this brings us to an uncomfortable but critical question. Do we as a society want to prioritize a cop's life over the lives of those that they interact with? Although again, this is never explicitly stated, that is the reality of what trainings that say, pull your gun, draw it quickly, fire quickly, don't think about it, make sure you get home to your family, will do. Now as a society, we have not officially made that our policy, that a cop's life is worth more than the average civilian's, but we have tacitly agreed to it. When a cop shoots and kills an unarmed person, which happens a lot in our society, Philando Castile is a perfect example, the courts hold up the Graham v. Connor standard. The Graham v. Connor standard is that in the moments where the police officer fires their gun, could they have reasonably believed that their life was in danger? And if so, the shooting is justified. Now it is of course more complex than that legally, but the effect is exactly that. And as we've seen with these trainings, they are teaching cops to always feel as if their life is in danger. And so a shooting will always be justified. This is why the cop in the Philando Castile case was not found guilty of murder. And the question is, are we okay with this? Are you okay with this? It seems to me that part of this tacit agreement is that many people feel like if a cop is interacting with you, you know, you're a suspect of a crime, you're not completely innocent. So really, it's almost like a cop is killing a criminal. And of course, yeah, a lot of the people that cops interact with have committed a crime. Hopefully I don't have to convince you that every crime is not the same on a moral or ethical level. Occasionally, cops do interact with people who commit violent offenses, like murder. Often, a violent offense isn't quite murder. It's domestic abuse. It's a bar fight. However, the vast, vast majority of crimes that lead people to interact with, with a cop are misdemeanors or infractions, things like drug crimes, or a speeding ticket. The American justice system sells itself as fair because everybody gets their day in court. It's literally your constitutional right, specifically the Sixth Amendment. The idea that Americans were entitled to their lives was so important that it was placed into the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. If you were killed by a cop at any point, that cop, which is a surrogate of the government, has deprived you of your Sixth Amendment rights and your right to life. And at this point, we have delegated the decision of whether a cop can deprive you of those rights to the police themselves. We legally allow law enforcement to deprive us of those rights. And the question is, is do you think that they are appropriately treating that privilege? We've done that under the belief that the training that they're being given is sensitive to that privilege and appreciates that you or I don't want to be deprived of those rights for any unjust reason. But as we've seen with the trainings, that privilege is minimized and they do that by dehumanizing the public. And this is how we have to come to the conclusion that a cop's life is worth more than others. So are we okay with that? Before we can answer that question, we have to look if there's even alternatives to what they're doing now. Because if there isn't, maybe this is just what we have to live with. Now, talking to people about de-escalation training, especially if they're not familiar, they kind of imagine it like hostage negotiation, which isn't accurate. Assuming you watch my previous videos and so are super familiar with these FATS trainings, 
listen to the difference in how de-escalation training is described by the trainers. Our whole goal when we go to a scene and we have uh, some high stress situation is for absolutely everyone to go home safely. We teach officers that time and distance are our friends because so much of police work does involve communication and accurate communication with people that we feel like it's a subject that we need to reinforce continually. Um, this is every officer's worst nightmare for the suspect to get here, all right, to this level of aggression to where, heaven help us, we would have to engage in deadly force. Everything that we're focusing on as an organization is to avert that ultimate act. In some instances, they'll, they'll end up in a deadly force situation, and when I give them the briefing, the first question I ask them, I go, how does it feel if you were to be prosecuted, criminally prosecuted, because you're going to be a subject officer because you force that suspect to act the way he did. Now, there may be a point to where the suspect is going to engage in attack, all right? Now, just because he's coming, then no person is going to come at me like this, fist balled up, because maybe I'm not establishing any verbal communication. Maybe I'm not taking control. That can also convey a sign, you know, that that's, that's a signal for the suspect or the role player to attack. Now, does that justify using deadly force? Absolutely not. All right, so what we're looking for is for them to create that distance, go to a less than lethal option, all right, and, and do everything in their power to use the least amount of force necessary to control that situation. Staff Sergeant Scott Murray is in charge of use of force training, which includes extensive work in de-escalation tactics and calls where mental illness might be a factor. Where it's a critical incident, it's very tunnel vision. We're trying to get so the officer can get their thought process, their breathing down, to look at the whole picture. People who have mental illness come in yeah. and they explain, That's okay, something. I have schizophrenia yeah. or I have something else. These are the things that I deal with. This is how I will react. This is how I may react when the police show up. It's easy to feel like these two types of trainings exist in totally different realities. The FATS trainings sound like they're out of a world that's like an 80s or 90s action movie, aka Robocop or Judge Dredd. They teach fear and they teach you to act on that fear as quickly as possible. To me at least, the de-escalation trainings sound more like the world that I actually exist in. The bulk of what I did on duty was talking to people, not fighting them. So the best trainings that I had for what I actually did in a given shift were like trainings in persuasion and communication and, you know, if I'm being honest, emotional manipulation. You know, and I can think of maybe like twice in my eight years on the job that I ever heard people talk about de-escalation favorably and positively during a kind of a training scenario. But I think I would have really benefited from a lot more sophisticated training in de-escalation and conflict resolution. De-escalation training is more about buying time. It's about giving yourself more information to make better decisions. It's also about buying time for the suspect to come to their senses or make a good decision. And it's about using appropriate levels of force depending on the circumstances. What was interesting to me watching all of the FATS trainings is that the civilians and reporters naturally do de-escalation. They actually need to be untrained by the officers from doing that. Please follow his orders. The last scene is the Please most confusing and disturbing. A traffic stop, a wanted man, and a preteen girl stop. bursting stop. from the truck stop. Stop. with a shotgun pointed at me. I shoot, miss, and stop firing, but... She's still a danger. Put that gun down! Put the gun down! He's got my gun. One of the I went through the scenarios too, without seeing what Moppin did. Do you have keys or uh, do you have anything you show me that? Yeah, don't worry about no, it. No, I need to talk to you. Come on, come on out over here. Oh. Well, I'm dead. His behavior was not rational, right? But I kept That's trying correct. to talk him into giving himself up because I wanted him. I wanted. I, I didn't want to shoot him. I, I just correct. didn't. And I think that's the hardest part, to buy into the de-escalation components for police officers that have been steeped in these FATS trainings for years. When you've been told for your entire career to escalate quickly and draw your gun quickly and make sure you get home right, to then have somebody come in, often younger than you, and tell you, hey, everything you've been doing all your career is totally wrong and it leads to you hurting and harming other people, yeah, that's natural to have some resistance to that. You know, and in law enforcement, there's a huge toxic masculinity problem where a lot of officers, they want to look tough 
and brag about how many people they think they could kill. So it's hard to have a really great discussion about de-escalation and and stuff like that because nobody wants to look weak. Nobody wants to look like they you know, don't have what it takes to do what needs to be done. That's why even though given the data that we're seeing from departments that have put these types of tactics in place, which show that not only is it safer for suspects, but officers actually end up getting shot and hurt a lot less often with them, they still don't want to do it. And I'm sure there are more people like me who are interested in seeing that that data does bear out in more places and it bears out more consistently in more studies. But it's hard when police departments won't try it or are openly hostile to it based only on how they feel. More often than not, police officers and police departments are amplifying misinformation about what de-escalation training actually is. Part of that misinformation, and it could be sincere confusion, is how programs like Campaign Zero get caught up in discussions around defunding or abolishing police departments. A common argument I see against it is that police departments have trouble coming up with more money, and if you don't want to give money to the cops, they can't pay for de-escalation training. Another cost that de-escalation training has is that often a lot of the tactics are about bringing more officers into a situation, not only because it makes the other officers feel safer, but because it encourages suspects to comply. So the argument from these law enforcement agencies is that if you want them to even consider doing it, you need to give them more money for the training and for the officers. But that's not the argument activists are making. They're not saying do more with less. They're saying reallocate what you have. Fast training machines are hundreds of thousands of dollars, not to mention the specialized trainers, the consultants, the training you actually have to give to the police all their time because they often spend 30 or 40 hours doing forms of firearms training of which the FATS is part of. All of that are costs that critics and activists believe you can turn into de-escalation training and get a better outcome from. Proponents of de-escalation training actually believe, with data to back it up, that de-escalation can be a cost-saving or cost-neutral decision. In addition to that, places like Camden, New Jersey, who implemented a lot of these policies, actually hired more cops, but they did it at a lower rate, which maybe sounds bad if you're a cop right now, let's say in Seattle, making $130,000, $140,000, $250,000, which is a thing that exists in Seattle here. Maybe that doesn't sound good to you, and I totally get that, but we also need jobs, and maybe having more people employed as a whole instead of having a few people employed at a high amount is actually better. It means maybe less cops are working insane amounts of overtime. They're working under less stress. They're involved in less stressful situations. You know, and to be fair, there are plenty of nice, decent, peaceful cops that actually do want to de-escalate, do want to help people, um, aren't looking forward to a violent encounter. I've just never known them to be very influential in cop culture. They're typically in the minority, and they typically aren't driving the officer safety conversations, at least when I was in. And scoping out even higher, we can look at policies from a city, state, or national level. Even if we just legalize marijuana as a nation, we would save so much money on law enforcement costs by not enforcing these laws that we've decided now as a society aren't really a big deal. You save on the law enforcement, you save on not locking people up. Suddenly, there's more money to do these things. All of the things I just described, which hopefully sound reasonable, this is the real discussion that's happening from activists, organizers, and protesters. Yes, there is an abolish movement. I understand that. I am not currently a part of that. I currently believe we probably will always need some sort of security force. However, I obviously think it can be very, very different than what exists today, and I'm open to arguments of alternatives. But sadly, these conversations in good faith are not what police unions are amplifying or talking about. And the cynic in me thinks that they don't want to change because they don't think they should be subservient to what we, the public, who is paying their salaries, wants them to do. Let me just show you what de-escalation training can look like in the real world. This looked like it was going to end violently. Get your hands up! Get your hands up! Get your hands up right now! A cop named Jesse Kidder with his body cam 
a potential life and death face off with a man who had just allegedly killed two people. The new Richmond, Ohio police officer was warned the suspect was likely armed and apparently wanted to be killed by a cop, as you will hear. Shoot me! Put your hands out of your pocket now! Shoot me! No, man! Shoot I'm not gonna do it! Shoot me! Shoot me! Do that! Put your back up! The cop is rushed by the suspect, and the officer loses his balance, a critical moment, but he still doesn't fire. Backup police officers arrive. The suspect, Michael Wilcox, decides to give up and stays alive, largely because of the valor and fast thinking of this man, Officer Jesse Kidder. I was trying to open a dialogue with him, you know, I don't want to shoot you, just get on the ground, uh, but he wasn't having it. Um, he just kept repeating, shoot me. Uh, at one point, you know, he said, shoot me or I'll shoot you. Shoot me! Shoot me! Jesse Kidder has only been a cop for about one year. He's a Marine, served in Iraq, earned a Purple Heart, and only had a body cam because his family had bought it for him for his safety after the police shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. Now that we've seen this, now that we've gone through it, and hopefully you've watched all of these videos, let's now answer the most important question. As a society, do we philosophically believe that a police officer's life is worth more than others? The conclusion I've come to is no. I don't think anybody's life is inherently more or less valuable than another's. And that includes criminals and people that do commit crimes like murder. Yes, I do believe that self-defense situations exist in which a cop may be required to use force in order to prevent harm to themselves or others. But the reality is that those situations are incredibly rare. They're so rare, in fact, that even cops that are on the force for years and years never, ever experienced them. But I think I would have really benefited from a lot more sophisticated training in de-escalation and conflict resolution. You know, and I eventually learned how to do that on my own my last couple of years of law enforcement. But my first six years that I was on the job, I was a pretty ruthless aggressor and... I really regret it. You know, I still struggle with like angry thoughts and like violent ideation that came out of that training. And I know it's going to take a long, long time for me to sort of retrain my brain away from that kind of stuff. So, yeah, in my opinion, there needs to just be like a total overhaul of police training from top to bottom, from academy to veterans that emphasizes community care, lending a helping hand to people who are in crisis and use of force as a very last and not prestigious resort. I mean, I'm just telling you from experience, none of us are safer because a whole bunch of cops are ready to shoot first, shoot fast, and not ask any questions. There are lots of other ideas for how we can have a better policing structure. They've been described by Phil, they've been described by Norn Stamper, the ex-chief of police, by Radley Balco, the civil rights activists slash journalists, and by organizations like Campaign Zero. The sad reality is that we are thousands and thousands of lives too late to start implementing these policies. But we can save thousands of lives more, both of civilians and police officers, if we implement them now, today, as soon as possible. Please leave a comment with anything you agree, disagree, feel about this, any ideas that you have that I didn't mention. Um, I have a Discord, which I never advertise, but you can come if you want to talk about this stuff. I also am going to start doing more streams, so using this setup that we have here, which I'm happy to discuss it as well. Thank you so much to That Dang Dad and Phil. Please go watch him. I have learned so much watching his videos, especially the one on how being a police officer taught him how to dehumanize people. I'm Alex, aka Squid Tips, saying, ride fast, take chances. Thank you.